I'm kind of like an advocate for that type of that side of the industry. Like I'm going to be till the end. Like tacos, they're going to always be. I want it to be an underdog. I want it to be conflicting. I want it to be controversial and I want to have conversations about it. And that's like why the podcast is so important is because I'm giving now people an opportunity to confront me aloud, like and actually, hey, come on my podcast. Let's talk about why you don't like this. That was Mario Gale describing the thinking behind the Anchor Up and Chill podcast. Tacos, skateboarding, and fly fishing today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. If you get a chance, please head over to uh, Instagram and follow us at Wet Fly Swing. While there, just uh, if you can, send a DM or a comment so I know you're out there listening. And uh, we haven't done the lightning bolt, uh, mic lightning bolt. Let's try that out. Lightning bolt emoji with a mic and with a lightning bolt, a three emoji set. That's our set. Let's, let's give that a shot. I'd love to see that and, uh, and connect with you out there. Mario Gill, a guide in Northern California, brings a breath of fresh air today to the podcast. We find out the uh, what the best indicator is for steelhead fishing, and this is no joke. This is a killer tip. How to present the fly in shallow water to steelhead. Um, and we also get into a little bit on his skateboarding background. He's got some friends that were pretty, uh, pretty much like the Michael Jordan of skateboarding, so he's got a good connection. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com stonefly to get started right now. So without further ado, here is Mario Gale from tacoflyco.com. How's it going, Mario? What's up, Dave? It's going good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, Super stoked. Yeah, totally. Thanks for putting this together. I'm, you've, we've got some good stuff to talk about here. Uh, I, I, you know, tacos. I think. I mean, who doesn't love a good taco? I mean, it's. it's <laughs> I'm no joking. It's for sure. Like I probably eat it more than anything else. You know, uh, tacos and burritos. But, uh, but man, you got some good stuff. You're guiding. You've got a podcast going. So we're going to dig into all of that. But uh, before we get there, just talk about how you first got into fly fishing. Oh uh, yeah, man. Um, Thanks for having me on, dude. This is yeah. actually pretty cool because I, I found your podcast. Uh, I think I was Googling or, po- uh, you know, doing a search on on Apple Podcasts, and I, I I can't remember what I put, but you had a guide on. I can't remember his name either, but you guys were talking about Jack Trout, and uh, I, I, I can't remember the episode, but I subscribed. So oh, even cool. before you reached out, man, I was oh, subscribed awesome. to your podcast. Yeah, no, it's, it's a cool podcast, and I'm... Right I'm honored to be on here, dude. Um, so, yeah, dude, fly fishing, I, I love it, dude. I, I grew up a crazy fisherman. Um, my my dad was, you know, taking me to local reservoirs and such when I was a kid, bass fisherman. Um, to make a long story short, basically I had a neighbor who was like an OG steelheader. Um, he was a Japanese guy, and uh, they, they were awesome. It was like three brothers lived together, and... Um, one of them was a photographer too. And after I saw, you know, everyone, there's so many stories, river runs through it, dude. You know, I, because I'm a, I'm a, you know, I grew up in San Jose city kid. So I never really saw it. And after I saw that movie, I went next door and was like, Hey, I want to learn that fly fishing thing you do, you know, because I was a fishing junkie. So when I saw that movie, um, you know, just watching them stand in rivers, we always went to Tahoe when I was a kid. So I always saw rivers, but just never was introduced to it quote unquote properly, you know, like had someone show me. So, um, that sparked my interest. And then, you know, fast forward, shit, probably 20 years of, of, of bass fishing, uh, and you know, tournament bass fishing and all that stuff. I finally got to the Trinity river, caught a steelhead. Um, while I was using an indicator, I took the indicator off and I swung up a steelhead dude, like within 10 minutes of, of fly fishing. And that was it, man. That's like, (laughs) That was, uh, I was actually trying to find the exact date. I think that was uh, about exactly 10 years ago, almost oh, wow. this, this year. Yeah. That was it. Oh, wow. So yeah. So 10 years. So basically a bunch of bass fishing and then you got the feel of, uh, of steelhead Yeah. And, and then no turning back in 10 years. And now you've transitioned into guiding. I mean, how long have you been out there with on the guiding track? Uh, it'll be my second year this September. Nice. Actually. Yeah, man. 
Um, Trinity River, dude, it's just, that's where it started. Uh, that's where I fell in love with fly fishing. And obviously, you know, steelheading, fly fishing for steelhead is pretty hard. So it was like, I, I, I ended up picking like one of the hardest ways to get into it. But it was, it's still, it's like my favorite, man. You know, I, I love it. Yep. Totally. So you do a little bit of trout uh, fishing as well, like guiding and stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my, my guiding started on the Trinity River. And the reason being is I was pretty much under my buddy Andrew's like, you know, wing for um, five years, pretty much. I met him at the property I used to stay at when I'd go to Trinity. He guided there. He taught me everything I knew. I mean, we I was basically like living on the property. Uh, well, I would visit and then I ended up living on the property with him. And, you know, you know, when you're a guide and you want to go test the waters for your clients, it's good to have a friend you could take fishing, <laughs> you know? So I was like his, I was his tester. So he taught me everything, man. Yeah, so you're talking about, and I heard some of this, um, some of this on the bar. I'll put a link in the show notes to that barbless episode. I listened to that one with you and Chad. I was, I was interested. I, I, I was kind of a little worried about the barbless guys because they they didn't record an episode for a while. I thought they were out, but it sounds like they're they're back in the game. And, yeah, man. Uh, and re-recordings or recording now again. Yeah, yeah. I covered a lot of that, I, like you know where I started, and I th- I think like for your listeners and such, you know, barbless. Those guys were awesome i mean just to have me on when i was a clothing company and that's how i started so i started as a clothing company like a year before i guided and then i started guiding because you know got let go from the tech game man and oh yeah that's what i decided you know i was out there every day all the time i was rowing people into fish um you know friends uh coming up to the trinity um you know, even my friend who taught me, Andrew, I started rowing him into fish too, and it, it just kind of was a natural thing. Like I, 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 it was a, it was an easy transition, and uh, I, I'm just super stoked now that I get to do it, dude. That's it amazing. Yep. Pay the bills, and it's it's freaking insane. And you it's love a crazy it. feeling. Oh, dude, I do a lot. <laughs> That's cool. Hey, we've had this. You know, I've had lots of guides, and the conversation has come up a number of times, and I know a little bit because I did some guiding as well, and. Man, I mean, t- I, you you could probably speak to this, but I mean, I feel like some people are just made for guiding because I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't. I tell you, when I went out there, I always, I never enjoyed it. You know, I always felt like there was pressure, and I had to get him into steelhead, and it was just, it was, it was very nerve wracking. So I just kind of, you know, didn't do it. But I mean, it sounds like you're one of those guys that's just you love it out there. You kind of set expectations for your clients and all that stuff, and you're good to go. Yeah, man. You know, it's it's funny you bring that up. I think it's actually a really good point. Because it really isn't uh, for everyone. And my whole thing, I think why I love it so much is that, you know, I I used to take people snowboarding when I was a kid, like all my friends from San Jose, and teach them how to snowboard. And I loved it, you know. I used to take people bass fishing, and I loved it. And I my even my tech job was training and customer service. And, I mean, I was a waiter for eight years. And it's not like I like to, like, you know, cater to people. I just like to see people smile, you know. I like to I like to have an engagement with someone and even if like they're, you know, a pissed off customer or something like how I used to in my job, you know. I mean, I would get the pissed off customers, become friends with them, turn it around, get a renewal or whatever, and I felt good. And I think that that's like where guiding for me was a natural thing. And I'm not saying you didn't feel that way. It's just it also is a lot of pressure, dude. Like it's it's stressful, man. It's like, you know, especially with steelheading, and that's how I started. You know, you 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 got these people driving five hours, coming in into the cold. It's freezing. They they might have never even fished before, or maybe it's like their seventh fish to the Trinity, and they're like, "Well, Mario, get me into a fish." And I just I do this like I say I have the saying that my buddy told me once. He's like, "You know, you're Mario. You're a guide. You're not God." You know, so that's like what I, the mantra in my head as I'm like going down the river and we don't catch anything for a while. And I'm, I, and the whole thing too is, uh, um, Herb at the, uh, at the Trinity fly shop, who is just like, you know, California legend out here, um, primarily 100% swing fisherman, OG, awesome dude. So nice, hilarious, um, really supportive of me when I decided to get in the, in the guide game, especially on his home water, you know, um, he just said, hey, Mario, you know, it's not even all about the f- catching the fish, man. And that's like Taco Flaco. Like, we're about the fun of it and enjoying why you're getting outside. And I think that 
that's something that I want to constantly embrace in my guiding. So he said, you know, there's something about getting people out on the water, Mario, and guaranteeing them fish because it's stressful for you. He's like, that's not why you're out here, right? I'm like, no. And he's like, you're you're out there for the float of it. And that's, you know, for the, right. you know. So that's, that's it. yeah. And it's like, that's what I, I keep. That's another mantra in my head. And, you know, hey, man, like, look at that. That's a sick ass bird over there, bro. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. You know, exactly. we might have not have seen a fish in a while, and or something, but at least you know I'm sharing with them and reiterating with the people like how thankful they should be that they're actually in a boat on a river on the Trinity or wherever they're at. And also, my branding and my clientele, I purposely put myself out there in the way that I do so that I don't get the guys that are like. Well, I, I, you All know, right. Rick, Ricky over here gets me into fish every time. I'm like, well, you should go with Ricky, dude, because Ricky's going to take care of you and get you those guaranteed fish. Where with Taco, we're all about, like, the experience. Yeah, I mean, getting people into fish. And, and that steelhead is the ultimate because there's sometimes you go out there and you get skunked. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, if somebody's thinking if they were expecting to hook six fish— and they don't get anything, they might be disappointed, right? Is so you basically oh, yeah, dude. when you come in, do you have that conversation with the folks before they get there? Well, you know, it's weird because that's the part of learning how to be like how to engage with your customers and your clients and your in, in guiding, right? That's that's the stuff I don't think they teach you. Maybe they I so I did I didn't go to guide school, by the way. And you know, because I had a specific way that I fish, you know, and, and I I'm also sort of protective over the way I do things because I don't like it when people tell me how to do things a specific way, dude. I just don't like it because I feel like I'm also, you know, a natural teacher. So to, for someone to kind of, I mean, dude, I taught people for 13 years in the tech industry how to use these complex, you know, applications, like from the tech guy to the sales guy. So different personalities. So, um, yeah, man, I, I, I don't think I, I, I don't set the expectation like, hey, you're going to get a fish. But I at least say, you know, a, as we're on the boat, as we start fishing and we start conversing, I kind of get feel it out. I feel out what this person's expecting. I feel out like what kind of vibe they are. I've had clients, dude, on my boat that are like, so what do you think? Are we going to get one in the next run? Yeah. And how, how do you learn what to say to that? you kind of just got to be yourself. And in my response, I'll be like, dude, honestly, if you want to catch guaranteed catch, bro, we should probably take the boat out and go to the the stalker pond, yeah. <laughs> like as a joke, you know, and sometimes they'll laugh and sometimes they'll not. And to be honest, like having your own business and being an independent guide, I can actually honestly be like, well, if that guy hits me up again, maybe I don't want him in my boat, you know? Yeah, hey man, right. you know, like I might be actually busy this next weekend because, you know, I've, I've established that this person has expectations now. And, you know, yes, you can cash a paycheck and help pay rent. But, dude, honestly, at that part of stress in guiding, I just don't want, you know, I just don't need it because no. No. I don't know. You know, yeah, everyone's yeah. different. They all do it differently. So that's the kind of the way I, I approach the situation. I hear you. Yeah, I think you're on exactly the track. You, you eventually, you know, you're you're still fairly new. I mean, I think you're right. A couple of years. And, and, but over time your clients, you're going to develop that relationship where I've heard from these great clients out there that say, yeah, I mean, they're booked up and they've got the people that are like their friends that, you know what I mean? Every year the people come back, they're basically like they're fishing with their friends, but they're just clients. Oh yeah. Yeah, dude. Um, so you know that book, I, I don't know if you've read it. I, can't, I always forget the author's name, but it's sex, death and fly fishing. Oh yeah. Yeah. John Garrock. Oh dude. So that book is so sick. Um, I acquired it from some random guy I met on a river out in Oregon and the dude was super rad. And I read that book and he's, he's hilarious. And then, you know, you see, you, 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 then you read how about how he tried to guide and how salty it was for him and how much of it was a pain in the ass. And I, and I didn't relate to that at all because I love it. You know, I, I didn't relate to that part of the book, but I also get that that's his personality. And like, you know, also too, in relation to that book, he's getting those clients that are the dudes that have the money that come from wherever to go to Montana. And, you know, they're expecting a certain thing and they're expecting. And the way he would talk about his clients, you're just like, oh, man, dude. And, and in my head, when I was reading that section of the book, I'm like, man, I'm so lucky. Like my customers and my clients that come through the branding that I put out aren't like that. They're always like, what's up, dude? Like, they're super stoked and they're just happy to be on the taco boat. And I, I, 
I didn't plan it that way. It just ended up that way. And I'm fucking so stoked, man. Like, it's really cool. Like, I don't get those guys, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that section of that book was just like, oh, reading that, I'm like, man, thank God I don't feel like that, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. We had uh, John Garrick was actually on the podcast way back oh, in the, sick. episode 47. It was, at the time, it still is one of my biggest, you know, episodes because the guy, you know, he was... And he was, he was John Gerak. We talked a lot, actually talked a lot more about just his writing background and stuff. Cause I was kind of in, interested in that, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll link out to that. Um, so, well, Mario, I think, you know, today, I mean, taco fly, I want to dig into a little bit more on that for sure. I'm glad you brought that up. And also we want to get into some nymph fishing, talk about some steelhead nymphing for steel and things like that. But, um, you know, I just want to dig in. You, there's also the skateboarding thing. And for me, I go back to like sixth, seventh grade, man. I was like skater die, man. I was like a skater. I was like, <laughs> sick. And I had this period of time where I was like a diehard skateboarder. I thought it was going to be like kind of like my career. And actually, I wasn't even that good. But tell me about skateboarding. What, now, first, just tell us about like, is there any relation to, what is the relation to like tacos, fly fishing, and skateboarding? Or is there any there? Oh, there is, man. Um, you know, skating is, I, it's so weird. I just was back in San Jose uh, to go be with my family. Uh, and... I was at the skate park, dude, I'm 41 now, you know, and I was at the skate park and there's like kids there and stuff. And I actually got to sit back because I've been in the mountains for so long. I don't live in the city anymore. I live in the Sierra Nevadas and like, I, I still skate. I love it. Uh, but when I was at that park and I was looking around at all these kids and I'm just like, man, like this is what saved my life when I lived in this city. And it's, it's funny. Cause last night, my buddy who I took fishing, he skates and he fly fishes and we know mutual mutual people in the skate industry and stuff. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's sometimes a little cheesy when people say that, but skateboarding was like my, my, that's what made me feel like I could get through life. You know, life's hard in the city, bro. Like it's kind of gnarly, you know? And I was looking at all these kids like, man, I'm so glad I had skating when I grew up. Um, and, and I started when I was a kid, my, my cousin was a punk rocker and he showed me how to Ollie and showed me how to boneless boneless was my first trick. And that was in like 88. Right. And, and then it was hard and I stopped doing it. And I finally met some guys that like, were like, Hey Mario, you should come skating with us. Cause I was a snowboarder. And they're like, if you snowboard, dude, you should skate. And so they taught me pretty much how to skate. And I started at 13, which is actually kind of late. Um, for skateboarding, you know, usually it's like you, the guys that stick with it a long time, they start kind of early. Um, I started late and man, it just, I think, I, I think that what it was is it's like the camaraderie. You got a crew of homies that are like, you know, you, you fall in love with your friends as your family, you know, like they become your family in skating. It's like, you go, you you wake up and you on Saturday mornings and you go meet up with your crew of friends and you have this amazing dynamic and you're traveling around the city in like buses as teenagers, right? And then you get your first car and then you start going to the skate parks and like you just build these amazing relationships through this this thing and you're always searching, dude, for spots, right? You're always searching for like the new street skate spot or the new park and you're traveling a lot. And I feel like, that's also relatable to fishing, right? Right, fishing. You're always out. You're you're going to the next. Where's the next river? Where's the next lake? Oh, you know these guys. I heard about this bite over here, and it's very similar to skating. They put out a new video. You see some new spots. You're like, where is that spot? I want to go skate that. You know. So you start talking to people, and people are keeping it secret. It's so relatable in that way. It's crazy. Yeah. And so tacos. Same thing, bro. Like, <laughs> you know, you you go out like you're hunting for the taco spots, man. You know, you're out there trying to find the new spot, the new joint, especially when you're in San Jose, like, you know, city of over a million people. It's massive. You never know where that next, you know, hmm. greasy goodness, my mouth's already watering anytime I talk about it, you know. Um, oh, no. And I think that that's, you know, it's funny you ask that question. And I, I appreciate your, your, your like you know, inquisitiveness, dude, yeah. that's a word because really that is like, I think why all three of them to me is like, they're so important is you're searching the people you meet, the, the, the brothers and sisters you make along the way. Um, it's like a social thing, you know, all three of them, all three of those things. And, and taco, 
I think like you said, you know, you, you said you eat tacos on a regular basis too. Um, that's, I think, part of also like that branding that to me felt natural to say, well, dude, taco hunting is like fly fishing, you know? And so that name, the way it compared to fly fishing, I, I it really just was a natural thing to me to say, dude, they are kind of the same. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you know, it actually is. You know, we're not we're not keeping the fish that we not all the time, you know, sometimes maybe, but um, you know, hatchery fish. <laughs> but uh yeah, man. So I it, it's like this I swear, dude, it Dave, if I could like I, I maybe I will one day, like write a book on the story of how destiny took me to this path to end up to make taco. Which I don't know if that's like the end game, <laughs> but if I could write a story how it all came together, man, it's it's serendipitous, dude. It like gets me. It's like I was meant to follow this pathway to spread this like, hey man, tacos are hella fun. Tacos are cool. And so is fly fishing. <laughs> like I felt like yeah. I was meant to like go into that pathway, which is so freaking weird and kind of cheesy, but um Well it's cool. Yeah. It's it's cool because I mean obviously you you've got passion about it, but it, you know it's different that that's why it works you know don't you know you're you know no taco fly just you look at it you, the first time you're like what taco fly what is that you know it's kind of you're <laughs> interested you know so then once you get into it you see what you're all about and you know listen to a podcast and hear you and you hear the story and but yeah the taco so when you're going around I mean I eat a lot you know you got these little drive up right they got the the the, the silver kind of drive up taco uh, places is that i mean how do you know where to find a good taco <laughs> T- tell me that dude so you know what's so insane is that i'll google taco truck right and the taco trucks won't come up <laughs> and like oh, yeah. you know they're hidden and they're like so you know one of my tactics to finding places is you want to find out where the mexicanos live right that's a and also typically in a lot of big cities, man, some of the best party spots and dive bars are near those areas, you know, um, sometimes. And so you want to find out where the Mexicanos live and then, you know, time it. Like if you if you want to go find a taco truck, going in the middle of the day is not the best idea. I think like around dinner and after dinner because then you could see the lines. <laughs> and then All like, right. So you, you roll up to like, you know, maybe two or three taco trucks that have like, you know, like you said, like that silver lining. And yep. Hey, just because this dude has the fancy sign over here doesn't mean that that's the best taco. Right. You want to yeah. look and see like what how many people are lined there up go. there. <laughs> right. There you go. And so obviously a lot of trial and error, um, a lot of gut rot. <laughs> so you have to go to places and you'll just get destroyed. Um, maybe they're good, but then, you know, obviously post eating, you might not be stoked. (laughs) Yeah. So there's a lot of trial and error and it's just like, um, yeah, man, kind of doing the work. And, and that's the other part too, is I always reach out to people, man. I'm like, where do I go? And so, you know, you got to get that Intel, which is kind of like fishing. (laughs) Yeah. Same deal. You got to get the Intel. You got to ask people. So if I come into your town, like, where do you live, Dave? Uh, Portland, Oregon. Oh, dude. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, when I come up there, you're going to have to take me somewhere. Man. Oh, yeah. We're, <laughs> so. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get it. Well, I'm already, I'm already thinking as you're talking because I've gone to taco places all over Portland, and I know the areas, the, you know, the places like you're saying, you know, where you go to those areas, right? Okay, this is legit. You know, yeah, most of yeah. the people you see here. But occasionally you'll see these things pop up. You'll be in some random place, and it's a bunch of white white dudes, and then there's this yeah. taco, taco truck that pops up, and it's really good. Yeah, yeah, and you're right, and, and that's also – you know, those are the people who they, they've they like established like, OK, we're doing it. We're making tacos and we're going to bring these to the part of town where, you know, obviously we're going to bankroll because yeah. they found the combination and the ambiance and the vibe and the, you know, the way they set up their lighting, like in their truck <laughs> that brings yep. people in like a, you know, like a, like a, like an amazing run. <laughs> you're just totally. like, you're all up to this taco joint. And you're like, Oh man, these guys got it. And you're <laughs> right. It's like, they, they, there are a lot of people who they end up making it in, 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 you know, they start small, they make it where they start and then they move out to the other place. And it's just like, dude, those people who come from, like the really authentic style. Like I'm not saying even to make a good taco, you have to be from Mexico or, you know, start from the Mexican part of town. But, you know, it's a good test 
to get it get it started to see if it's good. And also, you know, people do make it out to those parts of towns to find, you know, those authentic taco places and the authentic taco. Um, yeah, man, it's it's fun, yeah. dude. I I love it. I'm. I'm I'm actually thinking like right now like where I'm gonna go. <laughs> you got me, you got me That's going, right. dude. That's right. Well, do you ever and uh, you know just to kind of wrap this thought up on the tacos? I uh, do you ever make your own? I mean, like you fish tacos, right? Go get some uh, some white fish off the oh, coast yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I do. Um, you know, I have like these recipes I've been working on. I have like you know certain seasonings that I grab, but I know I need to grab for you know specific ground beef or a uh, 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 carne asada. I've I've always tried to replicate what you can buy from a garnisaria, like mm-hmm. a, the it's called the arrachera pepperada. It's the it's like the 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 oh shoot, dude. It's like the um really thin steak, and oh, they yeah. marinate it in like paprika and dude, nice. Sunny D, Sunny Delight, dude. They actually like marinate their meat in Sunny Delight, and I didn't know, and I did it, and it's just like wow. So I do make my own tacos. I try to replicate what I get from the stores, but dude. Most of the time, I fail, bro. <laughs> so, That's it. Um, there, there are like uh, some fish taco recipes that I love, and like you said, white fish, um, dude, smallmouth. Oh my god, dude, so yeah, good. exactly. Oh my god, so good in a taco. It's it's That's right. It's, yeah, really good. <laughs> That's right. Nice. Well. Let's uh, let's transition. I just uh, you know I wanted to dig into, and we'll come back to this. I want to talk a little more about skating yeah, here, yeah. about maybe some of your skating heroes, because I know there's a there's a really good podcast on skateboarding as well out there. But um, yeah, let, let's dig let's dig into some niffing because I mean I niff for steelhead. I've I probably caught more steelhead on niffing is my guess because I had a period where I did a ton of niffing. But let's talk. So is the trendy like if you were to go steelhead fishing right now, take somebody out, is that where you'd be heading, Trinity? Uh, yeah, definitely, man. Um, there are ch- steelhead in the Trinity River all year long. Um, there's, you know, the Trinity River is massive, man. You got the upper Trinity, you got the lower Trinity where it's like big, where the two forks come together. Um, so, yeah, dude, I, I like nymphing a lot. I think that, you know, being that I'm a new fly fisherman, I'm, you know, sort of new, 10, 10 years mm-hmm. in the game, whatever, and started, I mean, I got my first steelhead on the swing accidentally taking a bobber off of a nymph rig, right? But I did swing it, which somebody told me to do. And I don't know, man. It's something like, and it was cool. And I like swinging and I love the spay cast style. But man, I think that a lot of, even me and my friends, um, we love bobbers, dude. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's not just, it's just not just how productive they are. Because obviously you're, you're in the run for a lot longer than you are with like, you know, a swing. And you're covering a lot more water when you have a drift boat, right? Um, it's just something for me when I see it, it, the indicators or the bobbers, whatever you want to call them, man. It just brings me back, dude. Like, it's like a kid, you know? And it's meditation for me, bro. Like, it really is. Um, so that, that I think, the in relation to the productivity of nymphing, um, I, it's just, I don't know, man. It's just... You're going to, you are, we all know if you, if you are an experienced steelheader, you're going to catch more fish on the bobber, right? That's, and there is something to say, say about the swing. Cause it's like the tug dude is gnarly, yep. right? right? It's insane. It's insane. It's like the coolest feeling. Um, nymphing, I, I feel like, dude, I've, I've, all of my friends all do it different. We all, it, we all do it differently, right? Are you guys fishing out of the, so you're in the boat. Is that mostly what you're doing? You're drifting down. Somebody's on the front fishing out of the boat. That's correct. Yeah. Most of the time that's what we'll do. Right. And then depending on the person's skill level, when we get up to run after we've gone into it, we'll back row it and maybe anchor up and let them, you know, do some drifts and then follow it out. Right. Like take the anchor up and follow it down the run. Um, That's typically most of the way, most of the time that's how we're catching fish on the Trinity. So when you're coming into the Trinity, say you're coming down, you have this run, you know, you're dropping into a little riffle rapid and you, you, know, you know, this great run. How are you setting up to fish that with the guy? Are you basically just saying, okay, there's where the fish are going to be. And, and, and you like drift it right in with his flight in the water. Yeah. Great question, man. So, um, you know, obviously learning a watershed, you have a, 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 a leg up on just running up to a river, right? That's just like, the, you learn the spots, right? You learn the little, the little dips where it goes, you know, from six inches to three feet, 
And what I do is when I roll up into a run and let's say like I know that there might be fish at the head of the riffle uh, or the head of the run or wherever it's at, I, I train my clients r- right away. I'm like, we're going to do this thing called dumping in and I call it dumping in. And that's where you're going to go back behind the boat with the cast and dump it down river. And the person in the front of the boat obviously gets first dibs at that. And the person in the back, and I let them know, after we dump in and we start, I'm going to pull the boat over to the left or the right, whichever direction, and you're going to dump in where he, his bobber lands or his, his or her bobber lands. So what my goal is, is to get that nymph. It's kind of like almost a high stick, right? Like you you dump it down river and have it land right on that ledge, like right where it's still six inches, but right where it's about to go three feet. And man, I catch so many steelhead that way because the boat hasn't gone into the run yet and we haven't scared the fish. And you're hitting that, uh, I heard you talk to one of your guests about swinging and there's that elbow in the top of the run. That's how I get people into fish in the boat is I have them dump it, dump the nymph down into that um, elbow of the riffle where it's soft and then where it's moving before the boat gets down in there. Right. And so that's a big, that's, that's like a very successful way. And typically most of the time, I mean, it's a nasty grab. It's like right when it lands in the water, two seconds, boom, that, that indicator shoots upstream or to the side or something. And that's such a great way of catching fish, man. And I think that what happens a lot of the time is when the boat dumps in to that run, if we don't catch anything on the dump and I pull the boat over to the left, whatever fish we kind of spooked out of there and moved into the riffle, like maybe there's some in the back of that soft water. They might have moved into that riffle. Boom, they grab it as soon as we stop the boat and we get a drift through the middle of the riffle, right? And or they're just sitting in the middle of the riffle. Um, so, you know, I think that there are certain things where it's like, you know, you come up to a run, you might expect them to be in that soft water. And you're like, how do I get the, the you know, my boat to not scare these fish. Well, that's one of the tactics you got to do is you got to cast it down river and follow it down. That's it. So basically you're, so you got the run coming up. So you have them cast directly down below the boat and then you're basically dropping that thing right into the run. So way before the, yeah, before the fish can see the boat. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it's so productive that way, man. A lot of fish like that. And it's like a, uh, you're shooting whatever they can do, maybe like a 30 foot cast or something like that. Yeah. It doesn't need to be too far. Um, I, I'd say, yeah, 30 feet is probably, I mean, if you get 30 feet, I have a lot of beginners, dude. So I get like 10, 15 feet. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, which is great. That's why yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. You're, you're on the oars. Yeah. Yeah, man. And so, you know, you got it. And that's where that's that like working together as with your client and like doing the back rowing to make sure you don't, you know, you get that person's indicator down river, back row, back row. And then as soon as it gets in there, then you push those four, those oars, you know, forward and boom, you're going forward down into the run. Um, I love it, dude. I'm just talking about it. I, I miss it. I can't wait to get back on the Trinity. Um, and then, of course, you know, steelhead love soft water. So, you know, you're fishing those riffles, your riffles, and then the back end of the bucket or the slow, long, long, big buckets that are, you know, anywhere from three to 15 feet, that, you know, indicator right off the side of the boat, just a good, you know, 45 degree angle in the front or maybe right off the oar or whatever. And just following it down. I mean, it's that easy. It's super simple. And um, I feel like, you know, it's, and I'm, of course, I'm not talking anything on swing fishing at all. It, not at all. But I, I don't know how to get those fish in the back of those giant buckets on a swing, man. You know, I really don't. But there's a lot of fish in them. And that's where, you know, I'll, I always am always changing the bobber distance too. You know, the indicator, I'm always sliding it, you know, three feet from the weight you know, six feet from the weight. And then when we get into those deep buckets, I grab that indo and I slide it up, make it deep so that they're making sure they're getting down in the back of that bucket. And I mean, you know, some of the times we're running nine feet from the indo to the, 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 the weight. And then we've got our flies at the end of that. And so, I mean, that's a total about 11, 12 feet. And we're only in maybe a, like a seven foot run. And I love bouncing the bottom. I always am trying to get my, my, you know, you got to set that weight up perfectly so that when it's going through the run, it's just ticking and it's not sliding in, but it's just ticking enough to where that end is kind of, you know, popping across and then gets grabbed that way. Right. There you so, go. What, what's your, uh, what, what's your bobber? What are you using there for your, your indicator or whatever? I use Jadicators, man. Um, Jadicator is a dude out of here in California and he makes them out of balsa. 
okay. and um, yeah, man, Jada Cater's uh, got got skills, dude. He makes a perfectly balanced Indo for specific setups. Uh, how do you He's spell got- that? J a y d a c a t o r. Shout out to Jada Cater, man. Still love you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I hadn't even heard of that. That's awesome. So this is kind of oh, dude. This is similar to um, kind of like a whatever a theme a thingamabob or something like that. No, man, it's no. actually different. So I think that if anyone is ever interested in getting into nymphing, and let's say like they've tried thingamabobbers, and they're just like, this sucks, man. Like, yeah, it's, it's draggy. It's hard. And that's how I started. I started with the thingamabobber, then I went to the airlocks, and then I started yep. using jadicators, dude. And what's cool about a jadicator, and I, like I said, I got a lot of beginners, um, they have less drag on the water. So when you go to go do you know, a water load cast or a, or a, um, a, a, a roll cast, mm-hmm. even the overhand cast, it's more streamlined. It's, it's, it has less drag. And also, too, they're shaped like a – you remember frog hairs? They uh, were like a, a Indo that was shaped like oval. Oh, okay. They're kind of based off of that, I think. is That's where like – so that you know the way that they're designed. You know when you got a good float going because the way he has them set up is will, it will actually go straight up and down when you have a proper nymph float, when you get that dead drift. And it's the greatest indicator – um, not just, I'm not saying the indicator, like as in an indicator, I'm saying it's the great, greatest indicator to let you know when you got a proper float, man, because it goes straight up and down when you know you got a good float. And I mean, yeah, you, you learn, I feel like even somebody who's nymphed for years and they're just like, ah, oh, man, I'm not doing that good. Like I'm not really catching a lot of fish nymphing. Try a Jadicator because okay. you're going to see a huge difference in like, if it's laying sideways, you obviously need to mend it the way it needs to so that it goes straight up and down. And that's when you got that. You, and then you learn a lot of mending control. You learn where the thingamabobbers in the airlocks, you don't. You don't know necessarily when you're getting that good float. You could even have great mends and and and, and, a, and, a, and a drag-free drift, but you still might have needed to do one more upstream mend to get it to actually pop down even further. Yeah, to that's be. a great... That's a great tip for sure. I mean, it's similar to obviously. There's a lot of overlap between the gear and like a um, like jig fishing with a bobber and jig is yeah. similar. You know, that big bobber is amazing because when it's vertical, you're like, okay, it's it's perfectly where you want it. And now let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Stonefly starts the design process by selecting wood for the handle based on a number of key factors, including grain pattern and depth, but they don't stop there. This piece of art is accentuated by strips of hardwood that complement and accentuate the handcrafted handle. The Stonefly uh, net not only looks beautiful, but has high quality netting that is easy on the fish and will last for years to come. Stonefly's goal is to create a unique custom classic wood net that's second to none and can be customized for a little extra touch. When Ethan designs a custom net, it's his hope that others will create amazing lasting memories for years to come. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net now. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly, S-T-O-N-E-F-L-Y, to get started right now. Okay, now let's get back to the show. Talk about, so just walk us through uh, first, maybe what you're using for flies and then talk about just the leader setup, how you set that up. Yeah, no worries. Um, so Trinity River, uh, man, there's this, th- this saying we have, always throw the rubber leg. <laughs> that's, uh-huh. how, like, that's how my buddy Andrew says yeah. it. And I mean, that rubber leg is like it's almost a standard, dude. I, I, I feel like I just always got a rubber leg. There are all kinds of variations, you know. Yeah. Black and black, white. Yeah, bl- yeah, black and white legs or, you know, um one of my favorites last year was an olive and black body with olive legs, dude. And it's so weird because, you know, one year, the year before, uh it was strictly black, man. I had to have a black rubber leg and it was just fire. And then the next year it was like, what's going on? I'm not getting them on black and I switch it up to this olive and black and boom, all of a sudden they're hitting, you know. So it's good to have a lot of different rubber legs in the box to kind of just just try it out, see what's hitting. Um and then from there, 
I, I, it's always different, man. It just depends on water clarity. Um, uh, the height, yeah, height of the water, time of the year. Uh, you know, are we got overcast or sun? But my standards that I always got in my box is a red copper john, man. Like seriously, the red copper john. I mean, anywhere. Someone just asked me what are my top three flies. It's it's my what I think it's my number one. Yeah, red <laughs> and copper, the red okay. copper john. Yeah, and um, so that's also something too. I I I pick the size depending on the water clarity and also like what time of year. Um, I like to go big early in the season and then I downsized I'll even downsize to 16s dude in the winter um, size 16 red copper johns on the Trinity River in the middle of January when there, we haven't gotten any rain are killer they work really good and then after that I try to kind of replicate something that's happening in the water right say we got our caddis going off or mm. BWOs whatever I'll, I'll try to match that third fly um, because you could use three on the trend oh, wow. and, and that's how we run it and so we, and then sometimes what I'll do, obviously, sometimes I'll even just rock two flies, right? And just, just be I'm like, okay, well, you know, we've got tight quarters. I don't want it there to be, you know, an extra fly on there. So you only need to. Um, also, sometimes I'll take the rubber leg off and I'll do uh, golden stones as my big fly. Sometimes I'll do the rubber leg with two a golden stone and then two a nymph. Um, and the... Other nymphs that I like to get, I mean, Trinity Fly Shop, dude, they always got some gems. Um, the Fly Shop in Reading, they got gems. There, there's, you know, a lot of custom ties going on in the area. Um, I, I, I don't think, you, you know, as a guide, as a fly fisherman too, you know, you, you got your secrets, right? You got your secret flies. And I'm not like that, dude. I'm, I'm pretty, tra- I'm pretty transparent, man. It's not uh, obviously if there's like. 30 boats on the water on average every weekend, I might keep my fly a little secret, but you know, the standards on the Trinity, um, that I like to use are the RCJs, red copper Johns or red copper wands. If you want to call it the wands, (laughs) uh, um, you know, and cycle princes in blue, orange, um, Dude, I even throw pink sometimes, but blue and orange and purple seem to be really good cycle princes, you know, attractor flies. Uh, dude, pheasant tails, man, PTs, like a beaded PT that you can't really beat that, especially on the trend. Um, caddis patterns, um, you know, you got your bird's nests. Um, and then what I also throw is I'll actually replicate the entire, dude, box that I, I use on the lower Sacramento River. Right. And those are, you know, paradigons, jig flies, jigged caddises, um, a lot of smaller stuff. Like I'll actually sometimes just grab my rod that I'm using at the lower sack. If we're not getting them on those stimulator flies, on those like attractive flies or those big flies, I'll grab that rod that I just used the day before with some clients on the lower sack and pop that out. And dude, all of a sudden we're getting bit. And those are smaller nymphs, just like small mayfly patterns. Um, I say definitely like have the red copper johns, the rubber legs, the golden stones, um, the psycho princes, and then, you know, your standard like PTs. And then from there, I always like to add, you know, some sort of groovy looking caddis fly or something that is a local fly where people are like, this is the one we throw, man. It's the purple with the white with the white collar or something like that. Um, but I think you could get away with nymphing for steelhead in most places when you're, you know, you're using bugs, uh, with those, with those four yeah. flies, man. I yeah, think. yeah, that's, that's a killer. How do you set up your, your, so if you have your lead fly, say a big, uh, gr- uh, whatever, uh, rubber leg, are you just tying off the bend of the hook or how are you doing the dropper? Yeah. So, you know, it's always different for me too on how I'm setting up my, my rigs. So one of the things I do is I set up my rigs pretty long now if i'm going really long um i might do i'm 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 doing it off the shank to answer your question yeah most of the time i'm doing to i i and then off the shank to the next fly right um sometimes if i'm using like a um a really really big uh rubber leg i'll go eye to eye dude and Sometimes I'll do that. It, it, it's just kind of dependent on how I'm feeling in the, in the runs that I'm fishing. And then also, if there's water, um, sometimes I'll, you know, go from six pound or or or, or, or 4X, right, to 3X. Um, and that will also change. But most of the time, getting away with just tying it off the shank, that's, that's fine. That's totally fine. Now, 
I, I see a lot of guides do it differently. Some guys go eye to eye or they'll do a tag for their smaller nymphs. I personally don't like the tag the tags just because I, I just have snapped off too many fish that way. So I try to go same thing down the, down the to the next fly eye to eye or eye to shank. And again, that just kind of depends on the run. And the reason I say that is I like to go eye to shank when it's a little snaggier, right? Eye to eye to eye to me seems like that gets snagged up more in rockier situations. That's just me. I don't know. I could be making it up, but <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then you know my 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 indicator setups, my nymphing setups, they pretty much are the same everywhere I go. It's just length and then also pound test difference. But most of the time, I'm I'm setting up like a nice probably four foot butt section, four to five foot butt section of twenty pound mono. That's to help that roll cast and to help that thing lay over when you're doing those roll casts with those big old long leaders. And then from that, I'll tie loop to loop perfection loops um, to my fluorocarbon. And that varies from 15 pound fluoro to 12 pound fluoro. And then I'll do basically maybe five feet of that. So now I'm at about nine feet of a liter, right? So that's on the Trinity. When I'm on the lower sack, I do uh, uh, eight feet of that fluorocarbon. So then I have a total of a 13 foot liter, right? So I make really long liters, man. And then at the end of that is where I've got my, either my tippet ring or my swivel. And then I add my flies there uh, 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 or uh, at the end of that swivel there. And I'll add, you know, depends on what I'm fishing, man. I might go 18 inches to each fly. I might go 24 inches to each fly. It just kind of depends on where I'm at, um, what sort of weights we're using. And I think the more you nymph, you kind of get a feel for that, right? You're like, okay, well, in this run, I might not even need weight, right? I might not even have have to put weight. And then in this next run, I'll put weight. And that's when you'll decide, okay, well, maybe if I put some weight on this, I'll actually only have 18 inches between each fly because they're going to be close together. And, you know, you just want it to kind of go down like it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're in a riffle, I feel like closer together is better. And I feel like in like bigger buckets, and bigger, bigger holes when the water's higher, further away seems to work better for me. Mm-hmm. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you broke down that very well. So fluoro, and then, and then, where does your um, indicator or the uh, you know the, the bobber you're talking? Where does that go in this mix? Where are you putting that in? So yeah, so it varies, right? So let's just say I'm launching at the back of my house in the Trinity River, right? There's a hole there. There's a hole that's a nice hole when it's winter flows, quote unquote winter flows. Um, I'll go six feet to the weight. So when I talk to my clients, I'm, I'm always talking about, so I have conversations even with friends, they'll come on my boat and they'll be like, well, how deep are you fishing? I'm like, well, 11 feet. So then they'll go 11 feet from the endo to the bottom fly. I'm like, no, 11 feet from the endo to the weight. And they're like, what? And it's like, yeah, dude, like we're actually going to be going deep. So it seems like it's a 15 foot leader, but it's, in my opinion, it's not because those flies aren't sinking like rocks to the bottom. They're sort of floating around. Right. And so I'll go six feet at the, in my backyard to start off. And that's going to be where it's, like I said, ticking that bottom, right? Um, at the general, at the, at the middle of the pool, even though it's four feet at the front, three feet at the, on top of it, and then four feet in the back, I'm going to go at six feet because I want it to, I want that, that weight to bounce as it's coming in. And you're going to get a lot of false bobber downs and people will say, a lot of clients will go, well, was that a fish? I'm like, no, we're going to get that all day. We're going to get a lot of a lot of false bobber downs. And I just feel like, you know, I do a lot of my guiding through the winter. And that's because I feel like those fish are just right there, snugged up on the bottom behind a rock or, you know, and they're not as grabby. So you don't have to go, uh, well, they're not as grabby. So they're not going to jump higher up in the water column to go grab a bug where in the, you know, when it's warmer or at the start of the season, then I'll go shallower when I get to that run in my backyard. I'll start four feet because they're actually willing to jump up a little bit. And, you know, I learned a really great tactic from um, a guide out there on the Trinity. He owns, um, well, he used to guide. I don't know if he guides anymore, but he's like, dude, as soon as you see those fish starting to grab that top bug, that means they're jumping for your flies. That means you can go pretty much any depth. And that's when I'll really make sure I get, less false bobber downs. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So because they're going to be grabbing more. And then, you know, you figure that out during each trip, each day, each week. Um, 
Well, it's funny you're asking these questions because like I never talk about my guiding, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's cool because I mean I've done, like I said, lots of it, and I mean the way I used to do it was quite a bit different than this. And it, you know, I mean you've got it dialed in, it, like just like the false bobber down. I mean, how how do you know, you know, the difference between a false bobber down and, and a fish? Yeah, you don't usually, you know, and so the whole idea is to make it so you balance your indicator rig with the proper amount of weight so that you're not scraping and getting, you know, it's stuck and you, and you know, most of the time a mile of river will kind of be, you know, like a mile of rivers got oh, this amount, this speed of runs, this depth and such. So I'm going to use an AB and just an AB and, or, Oh, you know what? This stretch of river actually came up two feet. So I'm going to actually do an SSG for the weight. Because I know I'm going to still get in that ticking on the bottom. So you're, you're balancing your indicator rig with your weights, right? And so the false bobber downs, if it's like every cast, lighten it up. Yeah. Right? Lighten, lighten it, it up. up just a little bit. And so when my, when my clients ask, well, why does it keep doing that? Go, well, because we're ticking the bottom. If you're not losing fl- – one of the things another guy told me, if you're not losing flies, you're not where the fish are at, right? Um, which is pretty much like 75% true, I think. Um, when you're indicator fishing and nymphing. Um, so I basically instruct them, you know, like which direction to set, always set downstream when you're in the boat. And I, I, I explain, you know, you're going to set every time that happens, man, because you know what, the, the, the 50th time it's going to be a steelhead and, you know, and I don't guarantee that, but in the 50th time it's going to pull back. And that's part of that 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 experience when you're guiding people to to reiterate that to them. It's all okay, man. Like you know, you're, it's gonna pull back one time, and sure enough, like you know, halfway down the river pulls back, and they're like, "Oh, I get it now. I understand." Like, yeah. So, and then I explain to them again, yeah, you're bouncing that that bead or that weight is bouncing on the bottom, and it, those flies are are bouncing along with it, and you're in that zone where those fish are. You know, it's right in front of their face, so. I definitely feel like, uh, I don't know, nymphing is also one of the easiest ways to introduce fly fishing to people. And that's my, that's my, that's my goal. You know, I want, I want to get more people outside. I want more advocates for our watersheds. I want more people to enjoy this lifestyle. And Indo fishing is just so, um, it's not it isn't easy, obviously. I mean, there's it's there's a lot of complexity to it if you want to make it complex. Um, but it is the best way to introduce people um, and, and the easiest way to get somebody into a California steelhead. Definitely. You, know? De- you mentioned the, the AB, SSG. What, what, what is that? You're talking about so the... those are gram. Those are like uh, the size of the beads that we oh, use. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So yeah. SSG, I think, is 1.2 um, grams. Uh, I think think a b and i dude honestly this is part of my like ruined brain i can never <laughs> a yeah. bb is 0.4 grams so. oh right right yeah yeah yeah, yeah totally yeah. okay so so you're putting on and so are you using like uh you know tungsten beads on the flies and stuff like that or is this all yeah it's funny you ask that man um so i actually use a lot of those dinsmores those uh dinsmores um the like refillable packs uh, 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 or the, the, um, the bio, you know, weights. So I, I like to use those a lot and, you know, tungsten doesn't sink as fast. Now I started using tungsten more in the lower Sacramento river because that water is big, man. Um, you, it can get to be pretty, pretty big down there and you need a fast sinking weight. Dude, we're even using like bass bullet weights <laughs> so like a 132nd ounce um in grams i don't even know what that translates to um i i'm i'm doing that more on bigger water to get down quicker and stay down longer because of the bigger water now trinity i won't do that because it's just not as deep and you know i think that that's where some guides i don't they might be they might be actually using um, tungsten out there on the trend. I'm personally not because I like to have a little bit more of a float natural style in the or natural float or drift down the river in the trend where same thing for the lower sack, but you just got it. I mean, you're fishing a lot of runs that are, you know, anywhere from 10 to 13 feet, right? 
And so you, you want to get down quick at the head of those pools, and that's where that tungsten comes into play. And so I have multiple uh, 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 different metals inside – well, if you want to call them <laughs> metals – inside my uh, – inside my weight box when I'm, when I'm on a okay. boat. Okay. So you're putting on, so you're not putting like tying the flies using a tungsten bead. You're actually just putting like split shot on, on the leader. A uh, good question as well, man. Um, so, you know, every shop sells different nymphs, right? Some sell, sell them with tungsten bead heads and some don't. Obviously tungsten's more expensive. And as a guide, um, it gets to be a, a pretty big hit on your, on your pocketbook. Now, on the lower sack, there are flies. I have to have a tungsten head because I just know that they work good and they get down. So I sacrifice that money. Um, I do when I personally tie my own flies myself that I'm using or maybe I had time to tie flies. I do use tungsten pretty much primarily um, all the time. But when you're buying in bulk, you just can't afford it, man. And does it make a huge difference? I think it kind of does. But then again, you know, when the water's low... I don't know if you necessarily really want to always be scraping like dredging, and that's where I think those brass beads do a little bit better because they're not, they're 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 they got kind of a more natural float when it's shallower. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. And I was just thinking. I mean, recently, I was out fishing the salmon fly hatch, and I was doing the the dropper, you know, like um, with a big salmon fly as my main fly, and then off of that, a little euro nymph down. Sometimes, you know, quite a ways below, but. I mean, it's just super effective, way more effective, that type of fishing. Uh, but again, this is this is not necessarily, like you said, you're not always fishing the deep water. You might be fishing something shallower and you don't need a Euro or a tungsten. So but when, when, when you put on the leader, so I just want to walk us back through to wrap this up. So you got your main fly. So how far above that main fly are you putting your, um, and then you have your swivel. Where is that split shot going? Uh, the split shot, so it goes right next to the swivel. Now, now, if I roll into a run that's pretty shallow, I'll slide that weight up sometimes. I'll slide. So I don't pinch my weights on super hard. I just lo- secure them so that they're locked in. And what I'll do is I'll actually slide that weight up closer to the indicator, like three or four feet if I'm in a really shallow run. And the reason that I do that is it's kind of like sliding your bobber almost, right? So you don't have to slide your bobber down. And what that does is that allows that whole rig, I mean, you're, you're basically shallowing up the rig, even though you have, you know, you're extending the length of the line past the weight, it actually will go through that run, that shallow run a lot more efficiently. If that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. So when you're, is your, you know, I kind of think of like the back bouncing and I'm not sure, you know, when, with gear, you could put on, uh, you know, weight where literally your weight's on the bottom and then your fly is trailing behind it. Yeah. Uh, low. You know, is is this, are you doing that at all or is this more, or is that weight still suspended? I mean, what, what's hitting, what's ticking the bottom? It's the, the weight. weight. Yeah, it's the weight. Yeah. So it is. So the yeah. weight's ticking the bottom. So the that fly is just trailing right behind it. Just So if you, so if you're at the swivel, so if you've got your main fly and then two feet to your swivel and your weight, so you got like two feet just hanging behind that that's right in the zone, basically. Yes, Flo- exactly. Kind of floating. Like that's where you wouldn't need a super heavy tungsten bead on that fly because you want it to float a little bit off the bottom. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and that's cool. and that's also even like the, the, the rubber legs I choose. The rubber legs, sometimes I choose rubber legs that have lead inside of them and sometimes I don't. And it's all about having that perfect. That's, I guess, the nymph game, man, is like that, that, that balance of weight and fly choice so that you're not dredging, but you're not, you're, 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 you're not dredging where you're getting stuck a lot, but you're actually bouncing along the bottom efficiently and in the strike zone longer for the specific run that you're fishing. And that's like all experience. Um, I think the basic way to start is the way that I explained how to set up the nymph rig and just start with an AB. <laughs> and learn your mending. Um, pick the proper size indicator uh, and, and learn the mending so that you're getting dead drifts, so that those flies are getting below that indicator. And then as you get good, better at that, start increasing your weights and pick, picking tungsten flies or other flies so that you're getting down quicker. Um, you know, you, it, bringing that up, I think, is super important because I, I do agree that when you do have tungsten on, you're getting down faster nymphing and you're going to catch more fish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. it's just cool. expensive. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know that that is that's the thing. It is spendy. Yeah, those those tongues and meats. So, okay, well, cool. Thanks for breaking that down. I think that definitely there's some good tips in there for some people, especially if they're new to the game. Um, um, before we get too far, you know, I, we're probably going to wrap this up pretty quick here, Mario. But um, 
talk about your podcast because I'm a big podcast. I've talked a lot about obviously where, you know, I'm hot on the podcasting. Why did you start that podcast? Well, first, what's the name and why did you start that thing? So uh, my podcast is called Anchor Up and Chill um, and Talk of Fly Co. Anchor Up and Chill podcast. And so, dude, I'm like a media junkie, man. I love, I, I mean, I have a giant computer in front of me right now. I've got camera here, GoPro here, microphone here. Like, I love gear, man, like electronic gear. And so I, I kind of got into like that through skating, right? Making mm. videos, shooting photos of friends. I've edited full length skate videos, um, which if you guys want to find it, it's called Tall Can. <laughs> it's online. Nice. Uh, I edited Perfect. that I think about ten years ago. Tall Can. If you look up Tall Can San Jose skateboarding, I think it'll come up or something like that. I could send you a link too, and people could check Perfect. the notes. Yeah, it kind of gives great. you an idea of how I grew up. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so, you know, obviously when you own your own company, um, which is like me, you know, you got to make your own content, man. No one's out there doing it. And I kind of fell off like with the video stuff, which I made a lot of videos when I first started this thing. And also prior to Taco, I used to make a lot of videos too and for fly fishing that were like skate videos, right? And I, it fell, I fell off, dude. And I think it's just one of those things where, you know, you, my brain changes interests, you know, and I, I was sort of like sitting there going like, what? I need to do something, man. Like, I need to make a video, but I haven't done the video. You know, and I keep telling myself that. Like, I, w- I want to make a full length fishing video, but I just haven't done it, dude. And so the next idea, I don't know what it was. Somebody told me, dude, why don't you start a podcast, Mario? Like, and they're like, you're funny. <laughs> I think it's like, I consider myself an idiot. I say it out loud all the time because I'm like a, like a, like a, you know, a self-proclaimed dummy. <laughs> So because of that, I think that, the, you know, I got suggestions to do like, dude, you should do a podcast like five times. So I finally was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to try it. And then Anchor came out with that thing where it makes it easy. Super simple. So my pilot episode, which I just got rid of, actually, um, was me driving down the road recording me talking off my phone. And I posted it and I got good, good feedback and the goal also too is I want to make something like I love, dude. Your podcast, I like how you you got you're a great interviewer, dude. And like you get to the technical parts of like fly fishing, which is important for me. I mean, I've learned things off your podcast just by listening to like three episodes, dude. And I think that one of my things is I want to make something where I can a let out my stupidity <laughs> into the public, and b like creative and try to be funny and also come up with like ways to promote my brand and my, and my guiding and like reports. And because, you know, everyone gets newsletters, man, you know, you could do a newsletter a hundred times and, you know, not a lot of people might open it, but right now, obviously with people driving with their phones and stuff, Hey, why don't I just do a report on a podcast? Makes it easy, simple. And then also I want to start to highlight like you know, people in the industry that are looked over and also hated. <laughs> so, because I, you know, I, 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 that's how I came into the game, and people didn't really like Taco when it started, and they some people still don't. And so, it's like I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like an advocate for that type of that side of the industry. Like I'm gonna be till the end. Like Taco's they're gonna always be. I want it to be an underdog. I want it to be conflicting i want it to be controversial and i want to have conversations about it and that's like why the podcast is so important is because i'm giving now people an opportunity to confront me aloud like and actually hey come on my podcast let's talk about why you don't like this or come on my podcast and i want to show people why you know they might say they don't like you (laughs) but you know, and, and I'm not saying anything like about Elon. Elon was my first guest, but my goal yeah, is that. That was a great one. Thanks, man. My goal is to have other people on. And the reason I had Elon on was because I think it's like how you asked me about like my skating and stuff. Like I wanted to talk about his comedy because I think that Elon's comedy is so important about his personality. And, you know, as a fly fisher person, he's he's obviously very influential in the way where he's just funny, dude. He's 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 got a great personality and. And so long answer to your question, I'm really excited about the podcast. I, I want to be um, like super, it's like cliche to say, man, but I want to be inclusive. I want to get some people on there that are like, <laughs> you know, uh, one of my goals is to get the owner of FFBI from Instagram. So if you got, if you hear this out there, buddy, and you're anonymous, you could stay anonymous. 
I would love to have you on. That'd be great. Now, F, so FFBI, what, now what is that? So oh, it's, is this, this is yeah. like an Instagram meme troll account, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking and about. And yeah. I, I don't even follow it because I just can't stand that, st- that like, negativity. I, my, a yeah. lot of my friends do. Um, you know, you get sucked into this negative aspect of fly fishing, which is just, like, so toxic. And yeah. also, I feel like the dude takes a lot of blows at people that he doesn't have repercussions. And, like, I want to have him on. And, like, so yeah. it's it, – those are things, like, I want it – like I said, I want to be controversial, but I want to be funny. I want it to be enjoyable and talk yeah, about things it. that – Yeah, that are, like – I know, love it. I, yeah. I, I, I think you're on the right track because I don't think there's anything like that necessarily out there. In the long form, that's why podcasting's I think, become so cool is that – not only is it a great way to learn on the go and stuff, and like, but also being able to get the long form interview, you know, the, right. that that that's disappeared in our society, kind of. But um, the I was just thinking, you know, Elon, and um, I mean, I definitely would love to get him on as well because oh, you should, think, dude. Yeah, yeah, it's it's cool, and I mean, he 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 his little thing he did with the Reddington was definitely good. That little short, dude, that wasn't that awesome? Video. Yeah, it was awesome. I love it because, you know, and we all get, I mean, I just recently got flack. One of our sponsors on the podcast um, is Turtle Box Audio, right? They, they make this rugged Bluetooth speaker. And uh, and I just had a great podcast with one of the founders. But people called me out and were like, dude, what is this? Like speakers? You know, I don't want to listen to music while on the river. You know, and it's not about that necessarily. It's not about like blasting a speaker on a trout stream or something. Right. But you know what I mean? But I, you know, obviously the more you get to know that company, they're a great company. I right. think the guys have an awesome story. I love music and I mm-hmm. love, you know, so I don't know. But you're always going to get that fact. And you're going a little deeper. So you're thinking you're probably going to be getting, I mean, <laughs> you probably don't have a negative review, review yet on your podcast. But, <laughs> you know, how's that going to feel when you get that, right? Ah, because dude, it's you know, cool. <laughs> yeah. You, you've, you've dealt with that on you. Or, well, have I've you dealt, dealt on negative that reviews. Out there? Oh, dude, I've had negative reviews since I started my, like, my video bl- fly fishing blogs, dude, you know, I get, I have screenshots of like people talking shit to me or, you know, to, you know, saying stuff to me about my brand, bro, like a lot. And you know what? It's fueled with fire, dude. Keep it coming because, you know, that one, that one person, that one dude that it's hating on what we got going on. I'm not saying that we're, oh, fuck it, we're cool, dude. You know, we're just about a good time bro like and honestly the crew of people we hang out with are so diverse and like i'm saying diverse in cultures like they are like you know i got people who go fishing with our crew that you know don't even like do anything as far as like mind expansion (laughs) they're sober right and they come chill with us and then you got the guy over here who's like borderline party animal they're like (laughs) and skaters and graffiti artists tattoo artists fly fishing guides like it's really cool that what taco is like brought to us our group and that's what's important to us it's it's our crew and it's not about this person over here that's saying oh, you guys are doing it wrong and blah 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 and and also you know why are you gonna have that guy on the show you're giving him a spotlight it's like yeah dude because that's kind of like our thing like that's my thing is is i want to be not controversial in a way where i'm pissing people off but sorta, <laughs> so, like that's no, kind of like I'm a skateboarder, man. You know that I grew. I yep. still skate. It's I'm like 28 years in, man. To tell us Amazing. like what to do and to tell us we can't, like that's just that's how I grew up, man. Like I I grew up that way. So it's not the more hate you give us, the more fuel it gives us, and I, that's, that's the awesome. other way. It's like translated into my fly fishing, you know, and my guiding and my company and my brand and stuff. And Super grateful and thankful that I was able to slam my entire life, and then now I get to chill on a boat. <laughs> it's perfect. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah. So well, this is all awesome. And, and as always, you know, I, I love. I think you know, I could talk skating. I'd love to, you know, bust that out for another hour. But uh, let, let's break. Let's break this down with the rapid fire. Let's just kind of hit on a couple of things because I don't want to miss you know a few of these things as we get out of here. Yeah. Um, first on skating. I mean, there's been, I know when I was involved way back in junior high, I'm a little bit older than you, but like, you know, uh, Pal Peralta, and, yep. you know, some of these Tony Hawk and all that. I mean, did you have one skating, one skating hero out there? Or is that a thing? Oh yeah, dude. Um, I had, I had a bunch, man. Oh, by the way, Pal Peralta, Steve Caballero, San Jose, yep. local homie, dude. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. You know those guys. Oh, yeah, dude. I, Cabby's, Cabby's a boy, dude. And it's not like a, that's not like a tout of the horn. It's just like, hey, man, if you guys know Cab, like, that's San Ho. I mean, that's special to me. Like, I grew up there with Cab go. in my town, you know? So Pal Peralta was like a big, giant thing in the 80s. And so having, like, 
you know, grown up in San Jose. And so San Jose culture, skateboard culture is pretty freaking robust, man. Like it's like San Jose and skating is like to, it, when you skate and you know about San Jose, right? There's a lot of history there. And Cabby is like definitely one of the dudes that huge. Yeah. Huge. Do you know man. that podcast? Do you know that? Have you heard of that podcast where the guy interviews all those huge uh, skaters? Uh, is it the nine club? Yeah. Yeah, dude. It. I love it. It's great. Those that's guys great are one. great, dude. Love um, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, when I was growing up, I feel like it's kind of like my fly fishing. There's so many ways it, it intertwines, man. But I was personally myself like a, a like an all-terrain skater. I wanted to be because Phil Shaw, rest in peace, Tim Brosh, rest in peace, and Dan Drobel. Those were like my three dudes that I like loved. And for people that skate, I'm sure you've seen them. These guys were like um, – Pretty much, Shopping. yeah, they could do everything, man. Like, mostly, like, well, they could do everything. They could skate transition. They could skate, you know, ledges. They skate fast. They skate, like, you know, um, with, like, originality, style. And those were the three guys that really influenced me. And that's what I wanted to do with skating is I wanted to be able to skate everything. I wanted to be able to skate transition, um, street. You know, I wasn't really techie, but I wanted to be able to do flip tricks, too, and so that's kind of like my fishing, dude. Like, I actually want to do everything. Like, I don't want to just be a dry fly fisherman. I don't want to just be a nympher. I don't want to just be a swinger. Like, I want to be a well-rounded fisherman, just like my skating was. So um, those those guys pretty much all like California dudes. Um, Phil Shaw, amazing dude. Uh, uh, rest, again, rest in peace. And Tim Brosh was a San Jose local, too. So I had Tim Brosh and, you know, Cab and Phil Shaw, like, next door in Palo Alto, like, these three guys were huge in the nineties and I really looked up to them, man. They were like the G's dude. Oh, That's awesome. Tickling my That's heart. Perfect. Yeah. I know. I love it. I love it. Um, well, let's keep this going. We'll keep the rapid fire going here. So uh boat, what are you running in your boat and what do you have for oars there? Uh, I got a 16 foot weight forward clack of craft 2007. She, her name's olive. She's yep. spicy, dude. I love it. She's got uh, broken hinges. <laughs> she's got nice. she's got she's got scrapes and bruises everywhere. Uh, the hub is broken twice. <laughs> I love the my hub? rig. Yeah, the hub on the trailer. <laughs> oh, the hub. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the boat's awesome. It's got six cup holders. <laughs> we're ready. Nice. We're ready to have some fun. Um, and then my oars. I'm running pro locks. I'm running actually nine sixes. Um, I was gonna go nine foot on the trend, but I was I got so used to ten foots when I first got the boat. I didn't even really know like the differences, yeah. and uh, yeah, man, I love the Prolox. They're really light. Um, they are uh, sort of unique in a way where they have a proprietary oar lock, which is you know a little sketch, but because if you have an emergency, you gotta like you know undo it and then with an Allen wrench and take it out. But I have bad shoulder problems, man, like from skating and like fishing, um, and. With the light oar, uh, I just felt like so much – like at the end of the day, I wasn't as beat as I was when I used my soars. Um, I think that was also, you know, getting used to oaring. But Prolox, man, a tsh, sick-ass oar, really, really light. I love them. I, I, I think they're a, great, a yep. great choice for someone that wants a really light um, oar. Perfect, perfect. Okay, cool. And uh, and we've got this little segment, the 222, which is top two tips, flies, and resources. And you've already covered the flies, so we'll, we've noted that. Um, and you've talked about some tips. Do you have a, maybe a couple more tips you want to throw there just quickly on if somebody's maybe new to nymph fishing for steelhead that could help them find a fish? Yeah, man. Um, you know, uh, I would say one of my biggest tips that I could give is save money on tippet. Um, fly fishing tip, it's expensive. Uh, get the Seaguar STS. It's the steelhead trout. Uh, salmon line it's got a red label on it you get it on on amazon it's cheap um you're probably going to have a lot of people buying that now because of the shortages but that's my best tip i can give people is get the six pound and the eight pound for your tippet for seal heading um it's cheap it's strong as hell dude i have had giant fish wrap me in rocks um and come out alive with the line just frayed apart and it, you're going to save a lot of money it's 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 thin it's the thinner seaguar that's the first tip. Um, the second tip, man, get yourself some Jadicators, dude. You got to get the Jadicators. They're expensive. People go $25 for three bobbers. Dude, I've been rocking the same nine indicators for two years. So, you know, they're made of balsa. They're going to teach you how to get proper floats, proper mending, proper indicating, right? Um, proper bobbering, <laughs> if you want to call it bobbering. <laughs> yep. um, I would say that those two, to get into the game of sniffing and starting to get out there and nymph more, um, 
for Steelhead and I mean, yeah, anywhere. Uh, yeah, Steelhead. I'd say that those are the, the two that I think Perfect. are the most important. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that you went back to the, the J Decatur because that's uh, one that I didn't I didn't know about. So um, yeah. and then and then what about resources? So anything else? Anything out there? If somebody wants to dig into this nymph fishing, maybe the Trinity. Where would you? Is there like a book, magazine, video, any any sort of online? Yeah, resources? you know. Um, uh, so there's a guy. He, it's actually more about like I guess like Euro nymphing and nymphing in general. And I think a lot of the stuff he teaches, you can translate into nymph fishing. And that's the guy named Trout Bitten. It's a... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. dude. Awesome. I love his yep. I love his instruction. I love what he puts out there as far as like, you know, how he nymphs, Euro nymphing yeah. style. And you can translate that into your indicator fishing. Trout Bitten is a great resource. Super good resource. Um, and then, honestly, man, I think uh, the second resource... Shoot. I don't even know. <laughs> Think about it for a sec, Mario, and I'll, I'll just highlight the fact that uh, I had uh, Dominic Swintoski from Trout Bitten. We had him on the podcast. I don't have the the episode right in front of me, but it's to this day, well, at least for, I think we did it last year. It was the most listened to uh, episode on the podcast last year. But yeah, but uh, Dominic, yeah, he broke down how he kind of, he I mean, he calls it, I guess, mono, mono nymphing. You know, yeah. It's kind of a mix where he's got streamers and, and he's kind of like Euro. It's, it's a little mix, but... But cool, man. Well, um, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, the resource would be, I would throw one out there is like probably the Trinity Fly Shop, right? Oh, yeah. Perfect, dude. Yeah. Like uh, Trinity Fly Shop. So Herb is primarily swing fishing. Um, Yeah. But if like you want to get good nymphs, Herb has got them, man. You just call You call that dude and you just say, hey, Herb, I'm coming. I want to get into steelheading or nymphing for steelhead. You don't even have to say anything about indicator fishing. You just want some nymphs. And tell him to hook you up with the box, and yeah, it's great, gotcha. co- great shot out, Dave. That's like, he's got, awesome. he's got the stuff. Like the the goods you can get if you spend a hundred bucks on nymphs through anyone. Um, Herb's got some jams, and he'll he'll throw in some stuff in there that's gonna help you out a lot. And I'll I'll, I'll drop I'll drop one name. All right, I'll drop one one nymph fly out there. I'm okay with saying it out loud. If I get ridiculed by my friends, I'm sorry, but I've been using it really long, guys. The Green Diablo. All right. Oh, there you go. That sounds great. <laughs> Diablo. Yeah. Nice. Screw Diablo. Okay, perfect. Um, what about uh, oh, just a podcast? Do you, it sounds like you listen. So do you have a favorite podcast you listen to? Dude, my favorite podcast right now is Bad Friends, dude, with uh, Bobby Lee and Andrew Santino. <laughs> they really, okay, bad they really motivated me to actually start my podcast. And uh, nice. Yeah, it's 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 awesome, dude. It's comedy at its finest. These guys are raunchy. They're they're hilarious, like insanely hilarious. And uh, I've been following them since I think episode five. They're they're mm-hmm. going at it, dude. It's they're doing really good. If you need a laugh. Check out Bad Friends. They're freaking hilarious. <laughs> okay. All right. Perfect. And uh, and uh, music, uh, band, or type of music that you're into? Oh, uh, dude. Uh, so right now, I'm actually really into this this rapper out of the Bay Area. His name is Larry June. Um, I've been listening to him a lot lately. Uh, I love all types of music, man. Um, I love doom metal like crazy. It's like one of my favorites. But Larry June right now is on the playlist. And then um, I'm actually kind of get going back to my my roots, man. And I've been listening to a lot of my Bloody Valentine lately. If you ever check them out, I mean they're okay, like an old uh, like noise metal band, um, super cool stuff. And yeah, so that kind of gives you an idea on how diverse my music is. And honestly, That's anyone perfect. wants to ever reach out to me and talk about music or introduce other bands to me after you hear those, please do. I need to up I need to upgrade the playlists. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll leave it there, Mario. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess this has been a lot of fun. If you have any, um, yeah, I guess in the next 12 months, anything new coming coming for you? Yeah, man, I'm excited, dude. I got uh, my first hosted trip out of Alaska. Um, this is the straight up Taco Flyco trip. Uh, we're just, I'm just taking people fishing up there. I'm not guiding or anything. And I'm hoping that more of those will be happening over the next few years. Keep an eye out on the website or the social media hopefully i can i can expand these and you know have them all over the world i, I really want to yeah. do that so I'm, I'm excited to have my first trip um there is actually a video hopefully it'll be coming out uh by the time um this airs there's a yeah. video coming out i can't say the name yet but it'll be announced on my website and stuff that's actually been that, that was made by a, a a a company that i admire and i'm really stoked on that and um hopefully oh, going to mexico dude i'm going back to mexico go. i think i'm going to try to get out to cancun with you uh, uh some friends and 
try to go get some uh, some bonefish, man. I'm I'm pretty excited nice. to go go back out there. So yeah, exciting year ahead, dude. I'm I'm really stoked. It's actually cool, man. Yeah, you know, up 2021's a a great upgrade <laughs> from 2020. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mario. Well, I'll let you get out of here. Thanks for uh, taking the time today, putting this together, and I'll send everybody out to uh, Taco Fly. Yeah. Dude, thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. I really do, man. Cool, man. All right. Have a good Have a good day. Yeah, you too, bro. Take care, Dave. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all links, everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 237, 237 to get the show notes. You could just click over right down in your app right now and just click right at the top. There should be a link that'll take you over there. And uh, the show notes will have uh, just direct links. It's an easy way to connect. Um, If you found this podcast helpful today, please share it on social and leave us a five-star review on whatever app you're listening on. I'm not sure if you're on uh, on Apple or whatever you're doing there, but uh, you can check that out or just head over to wetflyswing.com slash love. L O V E, and uh, that, that directs you to an easy place to do the same. Uh, if you can, uh, tune in next Tuesday morning and uh, subs- click that subscribe button so you get updated when Larry Dahlberg is here. Um, this guy is legit, the real deal. If you don't know Larry, he's one of like the old school fishermen who paved the way for a lot of the uh, fly guys and gear guys out there. Um, the Dahlberg diver, he's got a bunch of amazing stuff that's kind of like just like historic and badass so uh that's larry tuesday morning click subscribe if you haven't already so you get updated when that drops uh early early in the morning so uh, i'm not sure where you're at right now i'm gonna take a guess i mean i got one shot to guess where you are and i'm gonna say you are you are not on the river you're actually walking around the city right now and uh and uh getting ready for a trip um, that's my guess. You're walking around the city. You're just coming out of a fly shop. So if I'm correct, I would love to hear about it. Um, please check in with me. Uh, definitely looking forward to catching up with you soon. Hopefully on the next podcast, maybe on the river or maybe online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.